and uh, welcome to our evening service. Lovely to have you here. And uh, if you are, if you're new, if you're visiting the church, then uh, it's especially uh, nice to see you. Um, let's uh, let's begin with these words. These were words that we were uh, reflecting on in our service this morning. Just coming to the end of uh, one Timothy, and uh, this is a description of the God that we serve and the God who loves us uh, from the end of, of chapter 6. And uh, Timothy is given this charge to, to be faithful in, in his ministry uh, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, who no one has seen or can see, to him be honour and might forever. Amen. And um, it's, it's a wonderful reminder of the, the character and the nature of our God, who is so awesome in all of his attributes. And we're told there that no one has seen him and no one can see him, because in his essence, he is invisible. God is spirit. No one can see him. And yet the wonderful claim of the Bible is that this same God um, became flesh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, that the invisible became visible, that the word took flesh and that we have uh, seen him with the eyes of faith and we can read about him in the scriptures. And it's that same Jesus who uh, was willing even to give his own life as a ransom for, for people like us so that our sins could be forgiven and we could be made new. And uh, that's the God that we have um, come to worship this evening and we're gathered uh, only because of and in the name of uh, the Lord Jesus and um, so let's begin our, begin our time together with, with, with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that there is no one like you. You are the ruler of the heavens and the earth, and you deserve and are worthy uh, to receive all of the glory and the praise. Uh, we thank you for your... Um, amazing holiness, that you dwell in unapproachable light. Uh, we all know what it's like just to, to try to look at the, the sun with our, with our eyes, and we can, we can barely handle it, handle it for a moment. Um, how much more to, to try to gaze upon the unapproachable light of your glory. Um, and yet we do thank you that in the person of the Lord Jesus, you do invite us to come and know you, and to see you, and to have our sins uh, forgiven, and we thank you that it's through Christ that we are made fit to dwell with you forever. And we thank you that um, that is true of all who trust in you this evening, uh, that, we, uh, that we are loved uh, more than we could ever know, and that you have forgiven us of every sin, and you have made us new people, and we can rejoice in the new creations that we are and uh, we thank you that we can worship you this evening. And we do pray, Father, that you would please speak to each one of us this evening. Um, that as we sing to you, uh, our hearts would be thrilled by your character and all that you've done. And as we hear your word preached to us, uh, we would have hearts that are, are ready to be changed and that want to be changed um, to be more like Jesus. Um, and uh, we ask these things in his name. Amen going to uh, run through a couple of notices. Uh, so if you, if you are new, as I say, welcome, nice to have you. And uh, there are some contact cards that you can see on your tables and you can use one of the pens provided and fill those in at the end of the service. And uh, you can give it back to myself. And uh, that's a good first step to getting involved in, in the church. Um, so if you're in that category, do, do fill one of those in. Late Night Church. So Late Night Church is on this week. It's happening this Thursday, 7.45 here at the Hub, and um, it begins with a time of refreshments, gets going about 8 o'clock, and uh, we've been working our way through Luke's Gospel in the sessions that we've had so far. And uh, I'd love to encourage you to come along to this, um, particularly if you're not part of uh, a midweek Bible study group or a midweek home group already. 
Um, this would be a great thing to come to because you can just meet with a few other people from the church and hear, hear the Bible and um, it's, uh, it's good for that. And also, as we've said before, it might be that you know, if you're in a couple and one of you goes out on Wednesday and the other one has to stay in, well, then you could take the opportunity to go out on Thursday while the other one stays in. And so we want this to be, you know, to be able to serve, you know, to serve you. If you can't make a Wednesday night home group for whatever reason, do come along to this and, um, and it will be on. It will be on this Thursday. Uh, Men Behaving Dadly, that's this Saturday at 10 o'clock. Uh, it's always the se- second Saturday of the, uh, of the month. And um, this is a chance for uh, dads in the church who've got little ones to come along and we get the ride-ons out and we get all other kinds of toys out, and we have bacon sandwiches and coffee, and uh, there's a little Bible story for the kids, and we try to invite some of the dads to come to church again, and uh, the Lord, I mean, the Lord's been very good through this ministry. There's lots of um, people from the community, men from the community who come along, and uh, so um, if you're a dad, then you can, you can book on for that on, uh, on, on the website. Walking group, that's this Saturday, uh, also this Saturday at 10 o'clock. Um, they are going to be meeting at Holy Trinity Church in Dorking and uh, then going for a walk. I'm not sure what the distance is. It varies between a couple of miles right up into sort of eight miles, I think. Is that right, Paul? Do you ever go? <laughs> Sorry? Is he really? Okay. He's just had a baby. Okay. Is he bringing the baby, I wonder? In one of those... Uh, you know, papooses or whatever, they, whatever they're called. Uh, that's walking group <laughs> this Saturday. Only a very select group of people know the word papoose. You have to be sort of in a culture to know the word papoose. But uh, yeah, little, uh, little thing. Uh, so we've got seminars. Uh, Why trust the Bible? Um, there a new series of seminars coming up starting this Sunday, 11th of June to 9th of July. Um, these are put on before the morning service uh, at Tiffin Tiffin School, and we try to cover a range of topics in these seminars. Uh, We've done more practical things. Uh, We've done studies based on particular books in the Bible. And this is a more more apologetic topic, if you like. So we're going to consider the question, why trust the Bible? You know, the Word of God is the foundation of all that we are. It's um, often attacked and undermined by the culture around us. Why should we trust a book like that? How could we? Weren't the people who wrote it all prejudiced and in favour of God? And lots and lots of questions that come up all the time. Um, and if you want to just get a good handle on uh, why we can trust the words in front of us to be the true words of God, um, then this is something that you could come to. Uh, it might be also that you're, you know, you're at secondary school or at university and you're facing these kinds of challenges you know, from, uh, from fellow students and um, they're wondering how, how on earth you could believe such, a, such an ancient book. Well, come and have your mind sharpened and your heart warmed hopefully, in this series of seminars, um, and that's starting this Sunday. You can book on online. Also, uh, I thought it was on there, maybe not, but we've got the uh, prayer meeting coming up this Wednesday as well. So Late Night Church Thursday, we've got the prayer meeting on Wednesday, uh, followed by a members meeting. So if you are a member of the church, um, we'll be having a meeting after the prayer meeting this Wednesday, and uh, I'd love to encourage you to come to both of those, and uh, there'll also be a Zoom link um, as well, if you if you can't make it for whatever reason, but that's that's this Wednesday. There ends the notices. We're going to uh, we're going to sing to our great God now two songs. Uh, we're going to sing, uh, "Behold the power of His Word," uh, and "Beautiful, beautiful Saviour." We do have a beautiful Saviour, don't we? So let's stand and sing. power of his word he spoke creation came to be i will trust his promise he hung the stars a guarantee his word is strong enough for me i will trust his promise
We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the risen one and that you are the champion of heaven who has won the victory over Satan and over our sin and over death. And we thank you that you have opened our eyes, uh, that we can see you not just as a character from history, but as a beautiful saviour, that you've given us eyes to see you and to love you and to treasure you. And we thank you that you are the wonderful counsellor, the one who directs us and gently brings your wisdom to bear upon our lives and corrects us when we've gone wrong and rebukes us when we fail to listen and who always leads us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Uh, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to take a seat. And um, if you're new to these Sunday evening services, one of the regular features is a time of uh, reflection and prayer that we have for either unreached people groups in the world, uh, so communities across the globe who don't have really any or very little um, evangelical witness. And we pray that the Lord would do whatever it takes to get the gospel there. Uh, we pray for missionaries that we support and uh, we also pray for brothers and sisters in parts of the world where it uh, is very uh, tough to be a Christian. And Alex is going to come up and lead us in our reflections on the persecuted church now. Thanks. Uh, this evening, we're going to focus our attention on Christians who face severe persecution in Afghanistan. Uh, in recent years, the situation in Afghanistan has worsened. Um, uh, one particular reason for that has been uh, the US and UK troops withdrawing from, from the region. And uh, you might remember the chaos that, that this led to um, a few years back. And um, also the Taliban took control of, of Afghanistan again. Um, the Taliban strict, strict interpretation of Islamic law means that living as a Christian is a tremendous risk in the country, particularly if you're uh, a convert from Islam. For you see, to, to leave Islam in, in that country is, um, is seen as a betrayal, betrayal of your family. Uh, and a betrayal of your entire community. And so imagine for a moment uh, as if uh, that, that was you. Imagine the isolation that you would experience being cut off from your loved ones, rejected by your community, uh, and denied access to education and employment. Churches are basically non-existent in the country. Uh, because gathering openly for worship is highly dangerous. The persecution is so bad that Afghanistan is ranked number nine on the Open Doors uh, World Watch List for persecution of Christians. But even in the face of all the terrible adversity that they, they face, uh, these courageous Christians, they gather in secret underground churches to worship, uh, and support and encourage one another. Uh, I was reading on the Open Doors website, and they shared one story of, of one secret believer uh, from Afghanistan, and her, she told us that uh, her relatives had been killed because they're Christians. Uh, her Christian neighbors, they've just disappeared. She doesn't know where they've gone, what's happened to them. Uh, and yet she still talks about how, how she trusts in God and how... She longs to meet with other believers, and so she's been going along uh, in the cover of darkness to a kind of secret, secret church to meet with, um, with other Christians. Uh, Hebrews reminds us to uh, continue to remember those in prison as if you are together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So we're going to take a few minutes now on our tables uh, to pray for them. And so we could pray uh, asking God for their protection, strength and provision. Um, also that God might uh, soften the hearts, maybe even of the Taliban, and uh, bring transformation to the lives of, 
you know, all the people in Afghanistan. So let's take a few minutes now and bring our tables. Let's draw those uh, prayers to a close. Thank you for that, Alex. And uh, the, uh, the band are going to come up now, and we're going to sing another two songs, um, In Christ Alone and, uh, and Grace Alone. We are saved by free grace alone, in Jesus alone. And I uh, love the way that Ephesians, Ephesians 2 ties uh, both of these things together. So this is Ephesians 2, verse 4. Paul says, after s- describing that we were dead in our sin by, by nature, It says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. There was no one else in whom we could be made alive. Christ is the only one who could give us life. And there was no other means of being made alive than the grace of God freely given to us. We couldn't earn that. We couldn't work for that. That was a free gift in the one Lord Jesus. And let's stand and sing of those things together now.
Alone, you took on prayer. 
wonderful. Let's have a seat. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck us from his hand. We are everlastingly safe and secure uh, in the love of Christ. Praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to uh, have a couple of Bible readings now before Rory comes to preach to us. So uh, if you uh, would like to turn first of all to uh, 1 Peter 2, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, hearing Psalm 123 preached to us, but we'll have a New Testament reading first. This is uh, 1 Peter 2, not on the screen I'm afraid, so you'll need to uh, find uh, a Bible on your table um, or look it up on, uh, on your phone. Um, And it's uh, 1 Peter 2, and we're going to read verse 11 to 25. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honour the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin... And no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were all like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. And uh, then we are going to read Psalm 123. A song of ascents. I lift up my eyes to you, to you who sit enthroned in heaven. As the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a female slave look to the hands of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy on us. For we have endured no end of contempt. We have endured no end of ridicule from the arrogant or contempt from the proud. Now, in just, just a minute, Rory's going to come up and preach that to us. But I thought what we would do on our tables is just to very briefly have an opening discussion about Psalm 123. Because um, I'm often, I don't know if you're like this as well, when I hear the Bible read to me, or when I try to read it myself, sometimes my mind is on something else within two or three sentences. And, uh, and I need help to engage and to bring myself back. Um, and so we don't need to sort of unpick every detail, but just have a talk about what, you know, initial impressions. What struck you? Any images that grabbed you? What words stood out to you? Anything that was unclear? Questions that you might have? Just a- any initial thoughts you might have about the psalm, just for a couple of minutes. And then Rory's going to come and preach it to us.
well, uh, do draw those conversations to a close. Um, now, for those who don't know me, I'm Rory, uh, one of the members of staff here. I'm hoping that exercise hasn't just meant that you all now know what's going on, <laughs> and that renders this sermon um, completely useless. Um, hopefully, like me, the first time I read this, was that I remember reading this recently, was at the Media Fast, and I read it, and I thought, what the, what the dickens is that on about? And so I quickly moved on to the next psalm to not think about it. And then I came back to it, and then I found out I was preaching it, and I was thinking, oh, no, still don't understand it. So if anyone can enlighten me with that, that would be very helpful. Uh, maybe the Lord will as I, uh, as I preach. Uh, no, I think I do get it. Uh, shall we pray as we start? Yeah, let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, so much for your word. We thank you uh, that we're able to just discuss it then. Uh, but we also thank you that we can now hear it preached. And we pray, Father, that you will help um, me as I preach, help me to um, point to you by your Holy Spirit. Will you show us the Lord Jesus Christ? Help us as listeners to hear, not just uh, intellectually, but actually you will plant truths deep down into our hearts. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, podcasts. I don't know how many of you listen to podcasts. I try and listen to some. Uh, there are some Cornerstone ones available. This is not me plugging a Cornerstone one, though. Uh, I listen, my favorite one at the moment is one called The Rest is History. Anyone heard of that? Yes. I've got some nods. Some fellow geeks. Uh, you know, great. The Rest is History. The Rest is History uh, examines, believe it or not, history. Uh, and it looks back at, at various uh, aspects, or it, it takes particular topics and examines them uh, and to see what sort of lessons we can learn to, or to sort of inform us of what's going on. Uh, and now some of my favorite ones that they've done are these World Cup podcasts. And they do like the World Cup best kings and queens of England. You know, you can decide, is Elizabeth I the best monarch? Or is it Oliver Cromwell, who wasn't even a monarch? Oh, that's left field. Or uh, King Henry VIII, what a legend he was, yeah? Yeah? Liked him, did you? Horror show, by the way. Uh, or they do the, uh, they, they do the World Cup of British Prime Ministers. Who was the best Prime Minister? Was it, you know, Winston Churchill or Margaret Thatcher? Yeah? We've got all these ones that we could have. And, and you, tr you have to try and work out what makes these leaders good leaders. What is it that makes leaders good leaders? Is it that they lead the country into peace and prosperity? Is it that they are strong and they help those who are in need? Usually that's sort of the things that we're trying to work out is good about leaders. What are the leaders that we want? Who are they? And now in our, in our uh, country right now, our, I suppose we would say our leaders of King Charles III, and uh, although he doesn't do much leading, I suppose, he's more of a uh, constitutional monarch. As, well, he is a constitutional monarch. And we have our government, uh, the Tories. I'm sure we're all very happy with the Tories. Uh, that's usually the feel I get about the Conservative Party at the moment. I'm not making any comment on them today. But we're looking for a government and we expect them to be fair and we expect them to be strong and to set us rules and regulations that we can obey and adhere to fairly and that will help us when we're in, in the need, when we're struggling for money and rent and all the other things. Or we, That's what we want with our leaders. And, and we expect in our, in our democratic system, don't we, in the House of Parliament, we have our MP, Ed Davey, shout out to him. Yeah, He's meant to go into Parliament... And he's meant to listen to my views and represent me in Parliament. That's what we expect of our leaders. Whether, whether we get that is another story, isn't it? See, often, and I think you would agree with me on this, leaders are subpar and they cannot deliver. In fact, I would go to say that all earthly leaders have these sorts of shortcomings. Sometimes, I mean, and you can look at some of the old leaders of the past, and you, if you get me talking about this, I would love to uh, talk to you about Alexander the Great and Cyrus or, or all these other types of uh, leaders. But sometimes they get too powerful, and they're so powerful that they have no concern for their subjects. Sometimes, and maybe this is true of our age now, they're too powerless. 
and they can't manage the crises that we face, and they seem to get every decision wrong, in our opinion. Sometimes they're so powerful that they get vengeful, and they have no relief for those who dare oppose them. Sometimes they're corrupt and only help those who may be able to help them. So leaders, I think you'd agree, though there's a differing scale, they have shortcomings. They fail. They don't do what we want them to do. They're, they might have the strength, but they might not have the decency to listen to us, to represent us. But I think in this psalm, we have the ultimate answer to our desire for a strong leader, a leader who is both able to act, but not just able and powerful enough to act, but is able to listen and will listen to us and will act for our best. And so I have two points tonight. My first point is the king of mercy, the king of mercy. See, this psalmist, just as we might look to our leaders for guidance, as we look to our leaders for help and for giving us um, uh, some sort of help in this world, just as we might look to those leaders, the psalmist begins in verse 1. Look with me there. I lift up my eyes to you. I lift up my eyes to you. To who? To you who sit enthroned in heaven. Who is it that the psalmist looks to? He looks at the one the leaders of this country and thinks they're pathetic. And he looks up and he sees the one who sits enthroned in heaven. Or as other uh, translations would have it, he sits on heaven's throne. His dwelling place is in heaven. See, what is he doing? He's lifting his eyes and he's fixing them on the ultimate king. This here is the king of the universe. This here is God himself. This here is the one, if you look back in chapter 121, is the maker of heaven and earth. This is the ultimate king. This is not a king who is powerless. This is the most powerful king. This is the king of the universe, God himself. That's who he is. That's who he is. And so, what then is our relationship to him? Well, look with me down at verse 2, at the start of that. As the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a female slave look to the hand of her mistress. See, if, if God is the God of the universe, if God is the one that created all things, all things that we see, then those who live in this world are surely his subjects, his servants, or his slaves here. So just as he is the Lord of the universe, he's therefore the master, then we in this world are slaves and servants of him. So what does that require from us and how we relate to God of the universe? Well, it means that we need a correct view of who we are. We are not God. We are not the ones who should be demanding anything of him. In fact, we should realize that as slaves, we have nothing. And we should come to the God of the universe, the king, with humility. As slaves, that means, as servants, that means we come to obey. It means, just in, as as servants rely on their masters, just as servants depend on their masters to to treat them well, to provide for them for all they need, it means we have to be totally reliant and dependent on this king. It means that we owe him total allegiance. That's what it means for us. And so we get this image that the eyes of the slaves are on the hand of the master. The eyes of the maidservant is on the hand of a mistress. There's a totality here of all people. And why are the eyes on the hand? Well, the eyes are our desire. Their eyes is the, the organ of desire. It's what we need. It's what we want. It's what we look for. And we look at the hand. And the hand represents power, action. I don't know if you've seen this before. 
Maybe you've uh, been to a really posh restaurant or you've been to a wedding and uh, they, they've got some posh caterers in and uh, the food's coming out and then you have just one person, the, the sort of boss, the boss waiter, I don't know what he would be called. I'm sure someone in catering could tell me. Yeah? And he just, little finger. And then something happens, like, whoa, the power. Yeah? And then, oh, something else happens. And, but if you look at the, the waiters and, and the waitresses, their, their eyes are always on that person waiting for instruction. Yeah? You may, maybe you haven't been to posh restaurants, I don't know. Maybe you eat at McDonald's most of the time. That probably doesn't happen. Yeah? But maybe you've seen the, a dog and his master. You know those people that train their dogs? Paul. Because he knows he's going to get fed. Yeah? I'm not going to do, I'm not going to roll over. Yeah? It has movements. And then, then, then there's action. So the eyes of the slaves are always on the hand of the master. Or maybe, uh, maybe you're familiar as a, as a parent or as a child of a parent with the movement of dad to the pocket where the wallet is. Ooh, always looking for that. Bit of money there. So the eyes are looking at the hand. They're waiting for direction. They're waiting for provision. And what is it that they're actually waiting for in this psalm? And what does it show us about the character of the king of the universe? What type of leader is it? What is it that their eyes are looking for his hand to deliver? Well, look with me at the end of verse 2. So our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. His mercy. That's what the servant of God looks for. His mercy. What does mercy mean? Well, mercy is undeserved, unmerited favor. It's grace. It's everything I don't deserve, I, I, I get. It's un- I don't deserve this stuff that, that God gives me, but he gives it me. That's mercy. Nothing that I could do as a slave to deserve what the master gives me, yet he does. And you can see that the servant in this psalm expects it to happen. They're patiently waiting. Did you see the word till? So our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. He's going to show us his mercy. They, They know it. They know that he will show them mercy. It's really interesting as well in this psalm. I don't know if you noticed the psalm, the psalm begins with I. Do you see that? I lift up my eyes to you. Yet in verse 2 it goes, so our eyes look to the Lord our God. Yes, he's an individual, but he knows that he is part of a bigger group, a bigger community of God's people. But not only does it change from I to our and to was, but it changes from you to you who sit in thrones on heaven to what? To the Lord our God. The Lord our God. This is the covenant name of God. This is Yahweh. This is the personal, relational name of God. So the God of the universe, the king of all creation, is known by name by his servant. And now I think, and I don't know if the psalmist meant this, but I think this is meant to cast our minds back somewhere. And I think it's meant to cast our minds back to Exodus. Because in Exodus, what are the people of God in? At the start of Exodus, what are they in? They're slaves. They're in slavery in Egypt. And they're crying out to God for help, to the king of the universe to help. And does he help? Yes? Good, I'm loving not nodding heads. We're with me. He does, he helps. And he, uh, and he comes and he appears to, to Moses in the burning bush and he reveals to Moses for the first time who he is. I'm Yahweh. I am who I am. I am the covenant God. And so it is an exodus that he's going to make a name for who he is. 
It's an exodus that he's going to show that he is the merciful God and the king of the universe at the same time. He's the king of the universe as he defeats all opposing powers in Pharaoh and judges Pharaoh, but he is showing mercy all throughout that time as he leads them out of slavery into the wilderness. And what does he give them in the wilderness? The tabernacle. And I can see you're all excited about the tabernacle. Why? Because in the tabernacle, in the place called the Holy of Holies, you have the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant resembles that God is ruler. But on top of the Ark of the Covenant is what, people? The mercy seat. How good is that? On the, on the top of the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat. So in the Holy of Holies, which uh, resembles and is meant to symbolize the rule of the king of creation, there is a mercy seat. So it is not just the throne room of the king of creation, but it is the, mercy, it is the throne room of the merciful king of creation. For on that mercy seat... A sacrifice is made, blood is sprinkled, and man can dwell with God. That is incredible. And so God is merciful to his people, and God continues to be merciful to his people, though they don't deserve it, by the way, as he leads them all the way into the promised land. And so, the pilgrim, the pilgrims are looking to the God of mercy because he's always acted in mercy towards them. They look back at the Exodus. They look back at the tabernacle and they say, there is a God who is totally merciful, giving what we don't deserve, allowing for an access into a relationship with him. That's what they're singing about. That's what they're looking to. Now, in the same way, it gets better. It gets better for us. Because we go forward in the story of the Bible and we come to the Lord Jesus. And what is it that Jesus does for us? He leaves the throne room of mercy. We sang about it just before. Becomes fully man to show us mercy. He comes onto the scene and he says, Blessed are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. He is the merciful king of creation that becomes fully man so that he can go to a cross and display mercy to all who believe in him. We just read about it in Ephesians, didn't we? Rich in mercy. And then we can be alive after being dead in our transgressions. There is love and mercy on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we sing when, when we survey the wondrous cross. Did ever such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a crown? See, the merciful king of creation wears a different crown on that day. What of thorns? Why, though, to set slaves free? And so Romans chapter 3, verse 25 calls Jesus the mercy seat. Because in the mercy seat. And so Christ, in his great mercy and in his great love, brings us into the service of the king of the universe. And so let me ask you this question, because you might be here, and you might not know this mercy. Well, you can know it. That's the incredible thing. You can know the mercy of God. You can know the merciful king of the universe, if you would just come to the cross and experience and know and trust that Christ was merciful for you, that Christ shed, we sang about it just before, great songs before, shed his precious blood so that we can be his, that we can be his servant, that we can be his slave. We sing a song, and can it be? How incredible is this? See, we have experienced, if we are Christians, the undeserved, unmerited favor at the cross. And ever since that moment, we have been experiencing that favor throughout our lives as Christians. Do you know that? That right now, whatever your circumstance, God treats you in grace. 
And so we can expect humbly as slaves that God will do so again. Just as the pilgrims looked to God, the king of mercy, because he's always acted in mercy, we too look to God, the king of mercy, to Jesus, the king of mercy, because he's always acted towards us in mercy, hasn't he? In the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so then, in the light of that, what does the psalmist ask for? What does the pilgrims ask for? What do they appeal for? Well, here's my second point, the prayer for mercy. So we've just had verse one to two, and in the light of those two verses, you get this communal prayer of God that they sing. Because remember, if you have forgotten, and you've been coming to this series, and we've told you time and time again, they're going up to Jerusalem to celebrate some festivals, and as they go, they sing these songs to encourage one another, to warn one another, to help one another on the way. See, I went to, um, I went to, um, went to a concert yesterday in Manchester. What a, a rubbish drive that is, by the way. <laughs> went to a concert. We saw a band called the Arctic Monkeys. You might not have heard of them. That's absolutely fine. Fantastic band. Great musically. And as they, I mean, as they sing their songs, the majority of people in the crowd know the words off by heart. Yeah, and they're singing them along. Apart from me, I can't remember. So I just cannot get song words in my head. So I just sort of make noises. And then I think, you look like an absolute weirdo. Which I do anyway. But what's the difference between that or, for instance, yesterday, the FA Cup. There they are. They're singing their songs. They're singing their chants together. What's the difference between those things and what these are singing? Well, I don't think, number one, that in the Arctic Monkeys, people are singing to encourage one another and to lift people's spirits and to remind people of great tr- spiritual truths. I don't think when the FA, in the FA Cup, as Manchester United lost, and poor Man U, uh, as they lost, I don't think they were singing, singing laments, were they? It's all, it usually goes from singing praise to your team when they're winning to absolutely slandering your team to singing, you're not fit to wear the shirt. Very, <laughs> it's the biggest religion ever, isn't it, football? Whereas here, in dark times and in positive times, we sing, we sing, we sing. We don't sing once, and then that's it. Cool, glad that's over. No, we sing, and we sing, and we sing. And what is the prayer that they sing? We'll look down at verse 3. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy. See, here you can hear it, can't you? There is a deep anguish. There is a deep need in the, in the singer's prayer. And they, they've lifted their eyes on the king of mercy because they need to appeal for mercy at this time. Why do they need to appeal for mercy? Look down with me at verse 3, second part. For we have endured no end of contempt. We have endured no end of ridicule from the arrogant, of contempt from the proud. See, they appeal for mercy because they face, quite frankly, a merciless situation. See those words? Contempt. Contempt. Ridicule. And what was it, how much of it? We've endured no end. The word is, if you read the KJV, the King James Version, or even the the original, it's like, we're exceedingly filled with contempt. Like like a a glass that's been filled with with contempt and contempt, but it's overfilling. They've just had all of this this contempt and this ridicule. The the soul has had more than enough. It's, It's overflowing as people seem to, Direct verbals, verbals after verbals after verbals against them. Why? Well, it's probably an attack on their piety or their their holiness. See, remember, they're trying to live as God's people. They're trying to live for him. They're trying to say we live for one God. And as they pilgrim on the way up to Jerusalem, they walk a dangerous road where people who may be a lukewarm Jew who has no real uh, 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 desire to follow the living God mocks those who want to follow the living God with all of their hearts. It may be Gentile nations who 
follow many different gods who look at them, who, who serve one God. And they mock them and they pour contempt on them. Because of the desire to live as God's people in this world. See, the word uh, the proud actually means complacent or at ease. It's someone who is so at ease with this world that has no moral compass, that has no, uh, that has no thought of the divine or the moral. It pushes all of those things out the way, says there's, nothing, there's no sin, there's no judgment. That's not something we have to d- worry about. We're good enough as we are. We live however we want to live. We all do what's right in our eyes. The arrogant are those who are high and lofty, who fall mocking and ridiculing and pouring contempt. It's a pointless, merciless situation. As people mock and show derision for the people of God. You don't believe the things that you believe, do you? I mean, it's no different for us, is it? For you, for being a Christian, you don't believe that, the, that Jesus was really the Son of God. I mean, he got that himself, didn't he? You don't really believe That he died and rose again. You don't really believe in a final judgment of hell and, and, and a possibility of heaven, do you? That's such fairy tale nonsense. Have you heard this sort of stuff before? As you have a different opinion than your family and they they mock you at any given chance where the families are all together and you're picked up and, 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 and displayed as someone who's so odd and worth making a joke out of. As because you have a different opinion on sexual ethics, you're either seen as a weird, prudish person or you're so old and outdated that you have nothing relevant to say to anybody anymore. I'm not looking to anyone in particular there when I say old. What, you don't have sex? (laughs) You surely want to try before you buy. What a nonsense sentence that is, by the way. And you might be thinking, well, I don't always get these things. You know, generally it's all right. But listen, don't turn your ears off. These voices are everywhere. You turn on your TV and the TV is screaming at you that you are in the wrong, that you are worth mocking and deriding, that you are worth pouring on contempt. And so we live just as these pilgrims lived in a world that is merciless. There is no forgiveness. There is mocking. There is contempt. There is disgrace for us who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our world. Are you familiar with it? Or have you turned off to it? What I love, though is that there are three verbs of opposition, aren't there? There's three verbs of opposition. Did you see this? You get contempt twice, and you get ridicule once. But the word mercy is also said three times. I don't know if this is the purpose of of the psalmist, but I feel like it's reminding us that, yes, there is opposition in this world, but as soon as you drive yourself to the king of mercy and you go to his throne room, there is enough mercy to deal with that opposition. Hebrews uh, chapter uh, 4 verse 16 says this, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Why? So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's as if he read this psalm. So in the throne room, yes, we live in this merciless world. Yes, we live in a world that mocks and derides us and pours contempt on us. But in God's throne room, there is enough mercy and there is enough grace to deal with it. And so what is the mercy required? What do they want, these pilgrims? Is it relief? Is it release from 
all of this stuff going on? Well, I think ultimately, yes, right? We want an end to all of this mocking and, and derision. In, in Revelation 6, you, you get this amazing picture of souls underneath an altar, and they say, how long, sovereign Lord, before you judge the inhabitants of the earth? There's a desire that, 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 that there will be mercy and there will be release and there will be relief. But that day isn't today. And the answer to that prayer is not when they sing this song. Because those saints under the altar get given a white robe and say, just a little bit longer. It should make us want to pray, come Lord Jesus, bring this day of relief and release, although not yet. It's not yet. They, only do, they don't sing this one and then go, phew, ha, huh, opposition gone. Thank you, Lord. No. <laughs> they sing this again and again and again, three times a year. <laughs> because there's always going to be opposition in this world. There's always going to be people who oppose Christians. And so before the ultimate release, we must endure. We endure no end. We endure no end. And that is what we have to pray for mercy for. 2 Peter 1.3 says this, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Yes, we live in a world that's merciless, but God has given us everything that we need to face. We read 1 Peter 2. Superb words, aren't they? I mean, I would like to read it all again, but I haven't got time. But live such good lives, verse 12, among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So we're to live good lives in the face of this sort of, these, these, these voices that are so uh, dismissive of our faith. And, it, and then how do we do that? Well, we've been given the greatest mercy in the world. We've given the Lord Jesus Christ and the example that he's given us, the one who committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. But when they hurled their insults at him, derision, mocking, ridicule, he did not retaliate when he suffered. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And then in 1 Peter 4, it goes on to say, as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. It's the world. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. See, we live different to this world as Christians. We live for Christ. We're given everything that we need to go and live a different life to this world, a different way of living. And it will bring abuse and, and, he, and it will bring insults on us. But we have all that we need in Christ to face those things. So what are we praying for? We're praying like Christ as they hurled insults on him that we will not retaliate in kind, that we will not fall, that we will not sin. We're praying that rather than that, we're going to show mercy. For those who are merciful will be shown mercy. We're praying that in the light of suffering, we can pick up our eyes and we can see the God of mercy so that we may live in this world and remain steadfast, so that we may endure. That's what we need to pray for. That's what we need to pray for. So, how are you doing with this? Maybe, and I've said it before, this is the first time you've come face to face with the merciless, merciful, sorry. Let's get my words right there. King of the universe. Well, come, know him. Know him personally as these psalmists do. Have a relationship with the God of the universe. And Christian, you have experienced, you should have experienced these things. And maybe, maybe you're thinking, actually, I, 
maybe I haven't experienced these things. Why haven't I experienced these, these things? And that would be a good question for you to ask. Am I living a holy life that, that is separate from this world and looks different, so different that people question and are dismissive of me? But then maybe also you just need to see that the voices are everywhere. But also, we're in a family. And so if one of us goes down, we all go down. If one of us is hurt, we're a body. We all get hurt. It was a great, wasn't it, in lockdown. For those who were here in lockdown, we, uh, we, we took this tagline. If one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. Isn't it great to be reminded of that? We just heard tonight, Afghanistan, our brothers and sisters in Christ suffering. That should hurt us. When I hear of my youth group and if they are suffering in the front line at school, that should hurt me. That those words against them are words against me. Savior. So let's pain. And in light of those things, let's pray each other. Pray for ourselves. Pray. Let's come to the throne room of mercy. Let's thank God that He has acted in the most incredible moment of mercy. In, on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ as he shed his blood to save us. Let us thank God with all of our hearts that he has done that for us. Let's thank God that ever since he did that for us, ever since we trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, he has acted in mercy towards us. And we can sing that great song, Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Let's pray to see those mercies. And let's pray for mercy to face this merciless world. And as we pray for that, that let's pray for the mercy of ending all suffering. When Christ returns and brings final relief. And final release. No more mocking. No more ridicule. No more of Christ's servants taking that. Just ultimate gain. Let's pray for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that yes, you are the king of the universe. But you are the king of mercy too. We thank you that this is ultimately expressed in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray, Father, that in the light of that, you will help us to see how you've abundantly blessed us in, in mercy. And we pray, Father, that you will give us the mercy required to live in this world. And as we do this, Father, we pray that we will have our eyes fixed on that day when you return and you bring final release and final mercy. Help us long for that day. Have our prayer be come, Lord Jesus. Will you come, Lord, and bring your ultimate reign of mercy and faithfulness and joy and glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much, Rory. Um, and uh, we are we're going to uh, respond to uh, what we've heard, continue responding to what we've heard by singing uh, our last song. And uh, it's wonderful that we have um, so many Christian songwriters and bands who, who write songs uh, to help us to reflect on the truths that we, that we hear. And uh, we're going to close uh, by singing We Look to You. Uh, which uh, is exactly what we've just been thinking about, um, this song and this psalm, which calls us to look to God who delivers us and to look to him as the one who both rules and is, and is merciful. Um, so let's stand and, and sing that.
Lord, we thank you for what you have said to us uh, this evening and uh, we praise you that in all of life's difficulties and hardships we can look to you and we can find an unfailing source of love and we can lean on one who is powerful above all others and we can be assured of your, your rich mercy to us in Christ. We thank you, Father, that you never... Uh, ridicule or mock or make fun of your children. We thank you that you pour out love and affection upon us in Christ and you always welcome our prayers. And we thank you that one day you are going to come again to reign and to rule upon this earth. And in that day all the voices of mockery will be stopped and uh, only your praise will, um, will be sung forever. Uh, help us in, in the difficulties that we face this week, and we will all have them, um, to look to you, first of all, uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please have a seat. And we are at the end of our service. Uh, lovely to have had you with us this morning. Uh, if you are a member of the church, do remember the prayer meeting coming up on Wednesday, followed by the uh, members' meeting. And if you're new, please don't rush off if you don't have to. You can fill in one of those contact cards, stay and chat with those on your, um, on your table. And uh, if you can't make anything that's going on during the week, then we'll see you, Lord willing, next, uh, next Sunday. Thank you.